Thank you. I would like to express my uh, gratitude being here. I really like to be here in Belgrade at the Institute again. I'm also thankful for this trust, trusting me in the last moment, this uh, lecture I prepared yesterday and today from, you'll see how, mainly I will improvise. And I would suggest that I need 40, 45 minutes, stops, and that's it. I know your time, but let's, let's do it that, that way. Uh, in retrospect, I, I just realized I have too much material, not, not too less, too much material. And being a philosopher myself, I'm constantly shifting from Lacan, of course, I'm from Ljubljana, to Foucault, Mirovsky, I don't know. And basically, the argument is very simple, maybe too simple, and I hope you don't find it bizarre. Uh, I, just, uh, I just put the title, How did neoliberalism survive its crisis? And the main question that interests me here is more, much more modest. Uh, it's just what of neoliberalism did survive and how? Uh, I would suggest uh, reading Philip Mirovsky's book, Never Let a Serious Crisis Go to Waste, to anybody who's interested, how did neoliberalism survive? Philip Mirovsky is a historian of economics, which, who is brilliant, and he wrote books on Mont Pelerin Society, on uh, neoliberalism, on uh, physics economics, uh, on computers and economics, machine dreams, etc. So, <laughs> But before I'm just improvising, let's give you five major steps in my argument. First, I will start with some very general reflection on the crisis and with Mirowski's description of what neoliberalism really is. Then, I'm going to point out major weakness for me in Mirowski's theory, which is double truth doctrine, uh, founded on Leo Strauss. And I would suggest that this double truth doctrine should be supplemented with the help of psychoanalysis, with the split between knowledge and belief. And from there, I will move to my point why I think neoliberalism is a religion and what is religion in neoliberalism. Then I will move very quickly to some concepts by Deleuze and Guattari. You see how I'm shifting from one discourse to another. And I will try to present you a concept of machinic enslavement, which is very near what my predecessor has been talking about. I mean, he started with uh, the persistence of uh, the idea of market even among the anti-capitalists left. He was talking about fetishism, he was talking about automatic subject, etc., etc. And here with machinic enslavement, we have some sort of idea how, uh, how state captures in a way. Of course, this machinic enslavement today goes with what Wendy Brown has called de-democratization and what we all call depolitization. And what, on the other hand, goes with deregulation in neoliberalism, which in fact is always re-regulation. Finally, I will use one uh, case, one special case from Slovenia, uh, with which I will try to present what basically uh, machinic enslavement is. I'm taking this category from Deleuze and Lazzarato, and I think Lazzarato cut short just in this area. Lazzarato simply thinks this is a critic of Althusser, Foucault, Lacan, whatever. But I think, I think uh, this uh, category has very, very wide critical potential. So that's, that's, the basic, that's the basic scheme. I already spent five minutes. So I need my glasses. The first thing we noticed already in this conference is the very laxity and the ambivalence of the very term crisis. The crisis of 2008 was something completely unexpected by the mainstream economists and politics alike. After initial denial, the crisis was understood as a major disaster that demands our urgent and immediate action. Suspensions of any debate or of any democratic procedure. 
In a way, everything was subordinated and devoted to solution of the crisis. While, at the same time, the crisis itself was minimized. And this discrepancy is that understands me. Why, on one hand, we're talking constantly about crisis, 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 and on the other hand, why this minimalization? This minimalization, of course, means that we don't see this crisis as a systemic crisis, as a crisis, as a capitalism, as a system. Meaning we, I mean the ruling ideology, of course. So crisis is seen as a sort of natural phenomena, which is normal, and which eventually will pass away, which will go away. And this discrepancy I was talking about presents no problem for the ruling ideology because it shifts from naturalization to moralization. The moral of the crisis is simple. Those, is, those who did not have enough structural reforms, those who did not prepare themselves for the global market, those who are not flexible enough will suffer so long as the, the, they do not recognize this global natural necessity of the market. The moral is simple. Adapt, reform, or simply perish. In other words, same causes that one could say brought the crisis are now seen as a remedy for it. It's nothing new. We knew it from philosophy, from Heidegger to Heidegger, etc. Gilles Deleuze, in his visionary text, Postscripts on the Societies of Control from 1990, put it in this way. The administration in charge never sees announcing supposedly necessary reforms to reform schools, to reform industries, to reform hospitals, the armed forces, prisons. So, constant reforms are seemingly the only answer. They are supposed to prevent future crises and even help finding solutions for the present one. So, in a way, the ruling ideology is presenting capitalism. Time is going very fast away. So I'm going to speak fast. In a way, we have here capitalism seen as a system without damaging properties, either for people or for the environment. A system which is here forever, and a system which does know, that does know not its beyond. In my country, instrumentalization of the crisis went together with austerity politics, and it was this I was talking about, maximization of the crisis. We must do everything just to overcome it. Crisis itself is the big problem. And at the same time, minimization of the crisis. The crisis will be over. We see, already we see the light at the end of the tunnel, etc., etc. So one could say that there was a huge manipulation with the crisis. But what I propose is, uh, not to see here just pure manipulation. My argument is simple. The manipulators are themselves manipulated, in a way. To put it differently, ideological operation which uses and instrumentalizes the crisis is itself split between knowledge and belief. What ideology I'm talking about? It's neoliberalism. And this is the true and only right question today which was posited by others, for instance, by Colin Crouch, in his work, The Strange Non-Death of Neoliberalism. What remains of neoliberalism after the financial crisis? Asks Crouch. The answer must be virtually everything. So, there are many books, texts on, uh, on the topic, topic of the crisis. And as I said, I would suggest that you read Mirowski's book, because the main question for Mirowski is, how neoliberalism survived in economics, how it survived in media, how it is today more alive than ever, and how, how it survived even among leftists, how certain, uh, how to put it, uh, um, uh, in English, uh, how, certain, how certain representations remain with us today. So, who are the neoliberals? And that's the first paradox we meet. After the Second World War, there was this Mont Pelerin society, etc., with Hayek, Milton Friedman, etc. And they, after a couple of years, they dropped out their self-nomination in public as neoliberals. 
The problem with neoliberalism today, there are politics, and the first day uh, Gerard de Mesnil has shown the graphics very, very graphically how, uh, how neoliberalism is more alive than ever. But the problem with neoliberalism is there is no Bible. There is no manifest of neoliberalism. There is no Ur text. There are, I would say, a kind of ten commandments. And I'm here using Miros's book to put them forward. First, these ten commandments concern the conditions of the construction of the good society. Society must be constructed, the state must be redefined and reshaped. So, there's no destruction of the state, there's reshaping of the state. But primarily, neoliberalism revises what it means to be a human person. And that was the point at the panel free see yesterday by Aaron Schuster brilliantly, who showed that the redefinition of uh, personhood, of uh, human person, is vitally important in neoliberalism. To see someone as uh, nothing and as grateful nothing, which is valuable at the same time and disposable. So here we have this team Foucault was constantly working uh, uh, in the 70s. Homo economicus is an entrepreneur of himself. Of course, all under the guidance of the market. And this is the central point, I, I guess. However, different neoliberals may spoke about the market and its nature. It is clear that market is for them the central point. Every problem has a market solution. Market can always provide solutions to problems seemingly caused by other factors, but in fact caused by it in the first place. So, we can speak with, in neoliberalism about marketization of government functions and marketization of society. Everything is seen as a fair game of marketization, even politics is approached as if, if it were a market. But there is no free market, really. Every market is combined, is a hybrid. It's, in a way, natural and construction. And here we have a problem uh, my predecessor was also talking about. How can we talk, then, about freedom? What is freedom if it's not necessity? And how, how to justify, in New Liberalists' eyes, that markets is not coercive? So they speak about negative freedom, etc., etc. And the main point would be that corporations and capital can do no wrong. They are always right. Market is always right. And they can flow freely across national borders, which doesn't apply to people and to working class, of course. So, as you all know, Margaret Thatcher put it, economics are the method, the object is to change the heart and soul. So, in a way, when Mirowski approaches neoliberalists, he proposes a couple of uh, conceptual devices how to think their organization, because there is no big center of neoliberalists. They have this little society, and they have these institutes and universities, etc., etc. His proposition is to see in neoliberalism a kind of thinking collective, which is dispersed, and which function, functions like babushka, like Russian doll. You take one layer, and then you find another layer. I don't know why did, why did he, he not use onion. He's American, perhaps it's too, it's too gross for him, but okay. It's, it's like onion. When you peel layer by layer, you don't find any real, uh, real center or real core. And uh, Mirowski tries to uh, explain inconsistencies, which are many in neoliberalism, and their uh, exoteric, esoteric speech via the help of Leo Strauss and his double truth doctrine. So, one thing for the masses, one thing for the media, and the other thing for the inner circle. So, shifting from conscious lies to manipulations, to self-criticism, denigration of masses, and promoting ignorance versus knowledge and silence, etc. This, this is the constant game. But Mirowski goes even so far to say, 
the major ambition of the neoliberal thought collective is to sow doubt and ignorance among the populace. So the major ambition is just to manipulate. What I suggest is, okay, that's part of the story. They never do what they preach. But to see why they persist with us still, one would have to turn the screw just one turn again. The manipulators are themselves manipulated, split between their knowledge and their belief. Here I will use some classic psychoanalytic conceptual apparatus. Octave Manoni in 1967 wrote a brilliant piece, Je sais mais quand même. I know very well, but where he uses this split between knowledge and belief, and he showed how it functions, you know. I know very well this is not true, but nonetheless, I believe, etc., etc. Uh, at this point, I would see a kind of religious moment of neoliber neoliberalism. I know that it sounds very pretentious, and one should be aware that there are very different kinds of neoliberals in the world. And generally, one could agree with, with Mirowski, there Neoliberals are often stone deaf when it comes to the transcendental and to the religion. There are cases when they sought some sort to found their doctrine on a con concrete religion, but uh, to claim that there is a religious moment in neo neoliberalism seems to be very pretentious. I, I wouldn't agree. I would say that in a way what they call market does have some religious properties, and in fact, what Schuster yesterday proposed uh, does have some philosophical substance. At this point, I will shift to another, uh, to another theoretician who claimed that capitalism, in his short fragment, Capitalism is, is a Religion, is a, is a fundamentally religious phenomenon. This is Walter Benjamin, of course. It's a very short fragment. And for Benjamin, capitalism as cult served to satisfy the same worries, anguish, disquiet that were formally addressed by religion. One could show, and this was my aim for an afternoon session, that talking <coughs> about crisis involves precisely such a dimension. The second point of Benjamin, I, I will not go in details. The second point for Benjamin is that Capitalism is the permanence of the cult. It is the celebration of the cult, sans rêve et sans mercy, without dreams and mercy. There are no weekdays. There is no day that is, uh, that is not a feast day. And recently, Jonathan Crary wrote a brilliant book, 24-7, where he showed that late capitalism uh, goes together with the uh, endless time, with the end of sleep. Just a quick point. I would suggest that Benjamin's thesis and analysis should be supplemented at least by two points. Okay, every day is a feast day and a holiday, but there is no final day of capitalism. Capitalism is forever here for the ruling ideology. And this, in the same manner, as my predecessor said, market is here forever. The second point, Benjamin says that there is no dream in the system. Sans rêves, he says. But I would, I would suggest the other way. I think that this system, in a way, uh, needs an utopian, dreamlike dimension. And I don't have time to go into Freud, but whoever is interested can check in his uh, interpretation of dreams, dreams about father who is awakening all night uh, at the coffin of his uh, dead son. And he was dreaming, Father, can't you see I'm burning? It's a famous dream used by Lacan in his 11th seminar. And I would suggest that, in a way, uh, neoliberalism, and as a recent form of capitalism, goes with these dreams. You know, In a way, neoliberalism knows that it brings disaster. But, you know, it's their fault. It's morals, you know. What is important, I will very quickly go to this. Can you follow me? I'm just skipping around, okay. 
What is important uh, in the light of crisis of 2008? It was that it was not used by world left, if, there, if it exists any, for a turning point. David Graeber points out in his book on death that the word crisis literally refers to a crossroads. It is the point where the thing could go either of two different ways. So it is alternative. You know, the famous dictum by Marx, uh, you know, the society of the future will be barbarism or communism, etc. So it is very, uh, it is very uh, strange that world left didn't use crisis as a uh, as a turning point. And this was already approached by Immanuel Wallenstein. I'm here relying on his analysis. It seems that the fundamental propositions of neoliberalism, which goes together with there is no alternative, are far more stubbornly with us than we would like to acknowledge. But uh, one other thing is very important for the uh, crisis is, first, as Joseph Stiglitz has pointed out in his free fall, the only surprise, I'm quoting, about the economic crisis of 2008 was it, that it came as a surprise to so many. So it surprised so many, and that's the question. Not just the mainstream economists who, like uh, Klugman says, they just revised some terms, etc. But it came to surprise so many. I don't have time to go into details, but, you know, we have so many analyses of capitalism, cynical, Capitalism, says Badiou. Late, says Mandel. Cultural, says Jameson. Cognitive, says Bouton. Digital, casino capitalism. Disastrous, pure, cool, financial, post forty But to see the, the possibility of this crisis, it was something different. System world theory saw it at the beginning of the 70s, but this is another story. Second major point about the crisis is, and this is pointed out by many, by Christian Marazzi in his violence of the financial capital, by Maurizio Lazzarato, by Philip Mirowski, even by Reinhardt and Rogoff in their, their classic mainstream book, this time is different. They are simply saying, that with this crisis, this claim is another story. And Stiglitz himself also pointed out we won't and can't go back to the world as it was before the crisis. Are we really, are we really uh, uh, on, conceptual, on conceptual level, are we really aware what does that mean? What does that mean, for instance, for Keynesian notions, for the left, etc.? I'm not so sure. So, one of the reasons for this failure of the left and for, uh, for other things and for persistence and resilience of the neoliberalism neo is that they simply are putting up uh, this notion of the market. At the outbreak of the crisis 2008, one was almost certain that the neoliberalism is discredited. How come it survived? Mirowski uses here psychology and someone called Leon Festinger's uh, theory of uh, cognitive dissonance theory. Suppose that an individual, says Festinger, in his work when prophecy falls, believes something with his whole heart. Suppose that he is then presented with unequivocal and undeniable evidence that this belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Indeed, he may even show a new fervor about convincing and converting people. And this uh, is a phenomenon which is very known here at, uh, it was very known always, uh, already in uh, former Yugoslavia when uh, Yugoslavian social regime was of self-management was came to the point where official ideology was a little weak or laid bare or proven false. The recife was just that. What we need is more of official ideology, much more of the same, much more of self-management. So. Uh, 
what I would suggest that uh, this belief is an unconscious belief and it is really here with us much more than we would like to uh, acknowledge. And here I would, I, I would draw on uh, Lacan, Zizek, Fader and Rastko Mochnik, which all uh, pointed out, uh, for instance, Lacan in his seventh seminary on ethics of psychoanalysis, pointed out the role of the choir in an ancient tragedy, which is constantly commenting the action, etc. And from there, Zizek and Fala developed uh, the concept of the, um, uh, interpassivity, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, the, 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 the most uh, used uh, concept from Zizek is canned laughter. So it's pre-recorded laughter we see on the TV when we see some sort of uh, stupid comedy, etc., etc. So, the, So the Zizek point is just that things laughs instead of us. And Robert Fowler, he wrote a book uh, on illusions without owners, had similar points I don't have time to go into. For instance, we intellectuals are obsessed with books, so we are constantly copying books and uh, putting them on shelves as they would be read, or uh, movie fans constantly recorded films or just downloaded from the internet today, and the, the movies would be watched by the computer or by the VCR machine. I mean, uh, this belief uh, in the market of effectivity of free market has material and financial consequences. And as Rajko Moschik has shown in the early 80s, this was the big uh, crisis in uh, Yugoslavia, which was partially, now we know, caused by uh, Volker and Ma from 1979. And uh, suddenly there was a shortage of, I don't know, uh, washing powder, coffee, etc., etc. And uh, there was a question, why do people behave as they do behave? Why, they, why do go to the shops and buy out every, every stuff if there's, uh, there's uh, enough of it? You know? And uh, Mochnik's point was that the, the argumentation uh, can be reconstructed as following. I'm not an idiot. I know there's enough of coffee or washing powder, whatever, but there are out there some naive persons who may believe that they will be bought out. So I transfer my belief onto some other which perhaps doesn't even exist. It's the same with illusions without owners in Faller. And in this way, I cause the shortage in the material and financial consequences. And I would say that uh, this notion of uh, self-governing uh, market uh, works the same way. Uh, there are philosophical features of this uh, concept of free market. So, usually we say, well, let's leave it to the market. Market will show, market knows, uh, market will decide, etc. So we are leaving our decision to market, which is supposedly free and spontaneous, etc. In this way, I would claim that market works as a sort of God in the cart. Uh, for the cart, uh, God is not only uh, good, uh, wise, etc., etc., but the crucial feature for this God, as historian of science has shown Alexander Quare, is his immense power, immense potestas. This is the crucial feature of a Cartesian God. And in this political, apolitical situation today, we simply leave our decisions or politics to this supposedly who works behind our backs. So, the market is, as Lacan would put it, supposed to know what to do. We leave him to do it. And this is 
perhaps the fundamental fantasy in neoliberalism. So this is uh, the way which uh, neoliberalism functions. As I said, this de deregulation goes in hand in hand with regulation, with distribution, redistribution, reprivatization, etc., etc. Uh, and for me, I have nothing. Uh, for me, this problem of uh, knowledge or belief is also uh, supplemented with another problem, uh, which is machinic enslavement. I don't have time to develop here either the notion of society control made by, made by uh, Gilles Deleuze in this postscript on the societies of control, or to present you fully uh, the division, conceptual division and uh, difference between machinic enslavement and social subjection in uh, Deleuze and Guattari. But it seems to me that in this uh, situation where we have, in a way, subject supposed to know cold market, we are relying on it and their way we are uh, producing new kinds of subjections. I will show on the particular case of uh, Slovenia. I mean. But before I come to that, I would just say that uh, Mm. This notion of society of control, what can find it in uh, Negris and Hart's empire, uh, they are not constantly used. And this uh, notion of machinic enslavement, I'm borrowing from Maurizio Lazzarato's book, Indebted Men, Making of Indebted Men, an essay on neoliberal condition, which presented that as the basis of social life, and which took up uh, Deleuze's uh, point that uh, today we don't put people anymore in prison, they simply, they simply uh, uh, got loan, etc. Yesterday on the panel free seat, Tamara Karaus presented uh, some very nice critique of Lazzarato, and I uh, do agree with her at some point, but as, as, I can, I, as it is obvious, I cannot uh, um, agree with her completely. What is Lazzarato's point? Lazzarato presents his main thesis in three steps. First, he showed how so-called uh, Fulker and Mai, the end of the uh, 70s, created uh, markets for, for financial uh, speculation, etc., and feed by uh, state debts, I mean, federal US states, uh, state debts, etc., etc. So, uh, figures are really fascinating. I mean, from the 80s onward on, uh, uh, regions, uh, states uh, are simply on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, in, put together in the budget of uh, France, uh, paying interest it is the second uh, highest, uh, uh, how to put it, the second, uh, on the second place of, uh, of the budget. In Slovenia, we have to pay our budget is 9.5 or 3 billion, and we are supposed to pay 1.2 billion for the interest this year. So it's, it's huge. The second step is a more philosophical one in Lazzarato, and it goes from Nietzsche, early Marx fragment, to the Lisan Gautari. And uh, this shows the link between production of subjectivity and control over it. The crucial role here is played by the double nature of money in the Lausanne Gauterie, where money functions simultaneously as income, purchase money, and capital, capitalism, in the way they show how money governs and commands the term mind, the terms our future. First step of Lazzarato's analysis shows how debt in neoliberalism restructures state, society, and individual. And here we have this uh, work on the self, self-torture, feelings of guilt, etc., of unemployed, etc. At this first stage, Lazzarato presents uh, his idea what machinic enslavement today is. His point, as I said, is simply to criticize Atisser, Foucault, Lacan, 
And the only, uh, the only uh, useful case he presents is cash machine, is bank machine. So bank machine works if you have PIN number, you can enter the system and then you're in the system. What I would propose is that we would look further to other cases, such as uh, computer algorithms to search potential terrorists on the net, uh, financial operation in stock exchange, uh, using computer-based analogy in economics, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, collecting data and making profits on the net, uh, various programs, for instance in Slovenia, which read text and search for plagiarism, email programs which automatically respond, etc., etc. So there's a whole uh, level of problematics which is left by Lazarato out. And to illustrate you what I mean here by this religious reliance on the market which knows, as a sub subject supposed to know, and uh, this resilience of neoliberalism which is with us today more, more here than ever, I will present you uh, the invention of Slovenian Research Agency. Slovenian Research Agency basically uh, founds research uh, program which I'm part of. And former director was a technocrat. His main catchword was transparency. So let's make things transparent and fair. So they designed a program an algorithm called CICRIS, which measures scientific excellency. So there's an automatic valuation of professional excellency, and this uh, evaluation is at any time available on the net for everybody, so it's public. So it's seemingly transparent, fair, objective, neutral, objective system, which helps to assess and to evaluate project proposals with the help, of course, of a couple of uh, independent reviews later in the process. It seems that at any, any time, every researcher has his or her evaluation and grade, similar to rating agency and uh, uh, rating agency rating. AA, AA plus, etc. I'm not kidding. It's really the same. So, this helps us in project proposals, because Slovenian research funding is the, the situation is the following. I don't know if you are familiar, but I have to present you the basic features. Uh, researchers, as I, as I do, have permanent posts and permanent job contracts. However, there is no permanent finding, funding. Every year there is a big competition for funding, and of course there is a lot of uh, a lot of work just to succeed in this competition. So in a way, it's an open market, one could say. Uh, Slovenian official mantra, because we're constantly, you know, lamenting how much money is it, and there is a shortage of money. I mean, from the outburst of the crisis, the agency uh, took short from, I don't know, 188 millions to 140, which is huge which is one for practically. And the other mantra is to apply for European funds and to go to search for funds in Europe. To show you the, the situation as it is, and our official ideology is that 50-50 could be the ratio between national funding and European funding. And to show you how successful we are with our uh, scientific Slovenian project proposal in this European, uh, in a competition for European, uh, this project, uh, just two things. First, there's a special prize award for those projects who enter the second phase and second run for applying for European project. And this is not some bargain money for us. It's worth three years of research progress. It's 100,000 euros just to get to the selection. So practically nobody can get it, and that's known in advance. Second, when in one of our cases, for instance, the results were the following. 100 and 135 projects were, uh, were, were financed by European Union, 
And one went to Poland, the other to Bulgaria, and one to Czech Republic. All other went to Germany, Great Britain, and France. That's the successful rate. So, our uh, official ideology is, well, try to find funding there. There is less and less money, of course. Half heavier and tougher is the competition. And the brain drain is, of course, raising. And it's a constant problem here in Serbia, in Croatia, etc. One or two, three final points considering this uh, idea of a fair and objective program. Uh, it evaluates the publication, considering if you publish something in the scientific review, it evaluates where this, this review stands in these international citation indexes. Uh, and it immediately gives you the point. In, I don't know, if you publish something in uh, Angelaki, Paragraph, etc., it's evaluated like that. If you publish in our review, Filozofsky, Vesnik, it's like that and, uh, and that. Uh, a lot of reviews were, of course, really trying to resist and to rebel this, uh, this model. And there was this uh, civil initiative who went so far to, uh, uh, to uh, contact the, the, the author of the program, so the, the programmer who, who wrote the algorithm and program. And finally, the result was that this guy was, was just confessing that he really does not know the, the spe specificities of the field. And he confessed that there are bugs in the program. And the agency, when faced with these facts, said, oh, it's still the most fair program there is. You know, it's still the most fair and neutral way to measure the succession. As you know from mathematics to philosophy, there is always a point in the system which is undecidable or which has some sort of impossibility, impasses, etc. For Lacan, it's called real. And here, this point converges with the really subjective, subjective perfect perspective from the programmer, from the agency, and last but not least, from the uh, private capital who is really, in fact, behind all these Francis and Taylor, etc. indexes, which are naturally giving the, the reviews at, and, uh, I don't know, uh, magazines, they are financing better rates, of course. So, in a way, through the back door, there comes a strange uh, thing called capital. And in a way, I don't know, these four indexes, from Scopus, Science Citation Index, Art and Humanity Citation Index, all that have this flow. So, in a way, one could see how this uh, supposedly neutral, objective system, which is not based on uh, human subjective perspective, is still based on the, some subjective presuppositions, and last but not least is based on the capital and on the European division of scientific labor. Thank you. Uh, and now I open the Q&A part of the panel, so please ask questions. Yes, I have cook. Oh, I'd like to speak, but there's another Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay, just picking up on one aspect of your multifaceted uh, talk, you, you said a few times that in neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism, belief in the market is, uh, is like religious belief, and you compare belief in the market to uh, belief in God in a cult. Uh, so I was wondering what you meant by that. I took it... I assume you, di you, didn't, you did not simply mean that it's a kind of unquestioning belief. You must also mean that the market uh, gives, at least from the perception of the people who believe, from the believer's point of view, it offers 
people something that gives meaning to their lives. So what do you think uh, gives, it offers by the way of meaning for, us, uh, uh, for people's lives? Uh, do I have to stand? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure that uh, I understand completely what you mean, but I think that I said that in neoliberalism some sort of uh, moralization uh, is the second part of naturalization. So there's a moral story behind that, and uh, there are various approaches to this. You know, for instance, I think Lazarato is uh, brilliant in showing how people who are unemployed are always bombarded with this guilt. You know, you are not employed because you are not flexible enough. You you cannot do that. I have this because in my family, my brother is unemployed in Slovenia, and I have close picture how it looks like to be an unemployed person at the bureau and how it functions. You know, they are constantly proposing you to, uh, to, uh, how to, how to put it, to find another profession, to, uh, to find another approach, that inventive, etc., etc. So in my ways, this is, uh, this is, the, this is the feedback, uh, in a way. I agree with you that things are constantly uh, checking up. We are f constantly checking up our sales, our success, successfulness, etc., etc., on the market, even on the market of ideas. You know, who's, who sells most books, who's most important, etc. But these are, uh, in a way, one could show that there are always behind that contingent uh, reasons for someone's success and uh, always some sort of power relations, if you like. You know. that's, that's my belief. Did I? Not quite, Not quite. okay. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I agree with what you say. I'm just, well, I'm wondering whether you're just using the term religious uh, as a handy uh, uh, way without, you don't really attach much meaning to the word religious when you compare belief in the market to uh, religion. Uh, but if you do, if, if, if you take it seriously, I think that might be uh, quite right. Uh, I think you also have to, you can't give a, a kind of a caricature of religion. You have to recognize that religions, religions give people some kind of meaning to their lives. So presumably, uh, from the perspective of the believers at least, so believers in the market in this case, the market doesn't just make them feel guilty, uh, that, that too perhaps, but it, it, it offers people something that allows them to imagine themselves as a certain kind of person. Yeah, yeah. Offers them. So, so I wonder, you know, what is that? Uh, that is, uh, what do you think uh, uh -huh. the market is? I see, I see. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, in a way, in the, well, it's pretentious to call it religious anyway. I, it's just provocation, you know. I wanted to to just point out there is a Dutpian dimension in this, you know, fictional. But on the other hand, I would take it seriously, as you suggest. And I started with Benjamin and I said that capitalism functions as a religion because it comforts anguish, fear, etc. Let's imagine someone who is manager and who has to cut, I don't know, who has to cut the personnel in his factory or his enterprise. He will not feel guilty because it's the market. It's the market who wants it, you know. And some politicians will say, well, we all believe in a social welfare state, etc. But it's the market who demands it, you know. And this is the one, the one part of the story. The other part of the story is more uh, from the bottom up. It's more tricky-like. Um, uh, I don't really believe in Lazarato's uh, solution, you know, because, or to say that everybody today is indebted involves some sort of, you know, you have to structurize the argument, you know. Of course, as uh, citizens of states who live in European Union, for instance, my state suffers a lot because there is no financial mechanism, you know. We transferred our sovereignty for our central bank to European central bank without there being a mechanism. And we are forced to go to the market to, to just loan money. And we are paying the price. Everybody is paying the price because we are living in austerity measures and still 
austerity measures and crisis is guilty for everything. Everybody says, well, we would like to have, I don't know, uh, free healthcare, but it's the crisis, it's the market. It's constantly this uh, justifying. Uh, but uh, seriously, there are people who cannot get loan. So you have this uh, situation with microloans on the other side. And there are uh, theories that uh, microloans are in fact a new liberal mechanism also, you know. So uh, I think the situation is complicated, you know, as well as with, with my case as researchers, you know. To qualify as a researcher and apply for a project demands that you have a PhD, that you have dissertation, that you have publications, enough that you can apply for a project. If you're independent, if you're not uh, linked with an institution, you are out. So there are very strict conditions who enters the, the system, and this goes uh, with what my predecessor Yape called superfluous people, you know. And in philosophy we have this, uh, this um, notion of uh, Giorgio Agamben of homo sacer, uh, meaning that there are some simply people who, who are uh, disposable, wasteable. I've leaved out the, the problem of waste in my presentation. Uh, I think that in new, new liberalism, and that's the Mirowski's point too, nothing goes to waste. Nothing is wasted. It's really nothing is wasted. And in this way, I would even say that to have uh, superfluous people serves certain purposes, of course. Uh, there's a brilliant uh, short piece translated in English in uh, October, uh, originally published in French in uh, Revue, La Kenyan Revue Ornicar by Jacques-Alain Miller, where he uh, tackles this uh, abandonment's notion of panopticon. And he shows how nothing is wasted. Everything is useful, reusable.